It's time for the main course, braised tongue and mandalay salad. I've got the tongue cooked for a couple hours. I took it out, I took off the skin and this rooty part, and now I'm making a sauce. The recipe called for either oil water or some strained tomato. I like tomatoes, so I'm adding some of that. Plus the cooking liquid from the tongue. Worcestershire sauce in the sauce. We are going to stick the tongue in there. Surround it with vegetables, carrots, onions, celery, pouring this in, and then I'm gonna pop it into the oven and it braises for a while. Hung is ready, it's been cooking for four hours. Now we can try our alternate meat entree. Now this is an alternate meat because people were encouraged to eat all parts of the meat. For middle class or well-to-do Americans, eating offal or eating you know, organ meats would have been seen as a sort of undesirable thing to do. Now in the middle of the 19th century, all sorts of Americans regularly ate kidneys and brains and those sorts of things. But by World War I, the government really had to have a campaign saying, you know, try to eat all parts of the animal so we can send those standard cuts of meat to Europe. It goes back to the, the notion of sacrifice. The Americans had become more prosperous uh, by the late 19th, early 20th century. The United States had become a very prosperous nation, um, you know, one of the world's leading economic powers. Um, and so Americans were eating more, more meat and more desirable cuts of meat and beef. And so going back to uh, what was considered poverty food was a sacrifice. Really. So whereas now this is the trendiest mm -hmm. food right. possible, mm -hmm. it was seen as poor people's food, right. poverty yeah, food. Yeah. The cookbooks also uh, encourage people to try new fish. Mm -hmm. The U.S. Department of Fisheries was making available all of these fish that they had been what we would now call trash fish, fish that were not considered good to eat mm -hmm. and they they told you all sorts of ways to eat these fish there were things like gray fish bowfin mm -hmm. they also were talking about try sea mussels mm -hmm. so mussels mm -hmm. must have just mm -hmm. come into mm -hmm. into use now do you know anything about the, the this approach to fish if any of these things came into common usage i don't know about the specific species of fish that were promoted but i think fish eating in general like promotion of poultry or, or game was part of this general effort to get people to eat different kinds of meat. Yeah, and some of the advertisements and publicity you know, reminded people that there was no concern with overfishing. It was, you know, fish feed themselves, they come from the sea, and, you know, we don't have to waste, you know, food feeding them, and that was, that was a... And now, of course, overfishing is a real problem. Yeah, absolutely. You're also making a mandalay salad. It has rice, peas, and a vinaigrette made with some cayenne pepper and some curry powder. Now, this is not... I think, uh, I think I'm safe in saying it's not an authentic Burmese recipe, <laughs> but reflecting cultural awareness of Burma and Burmese food. Uh, and I, I noticed um, recipes from a number of places that surprised me. There was a Hindu salad, it was called Hindu salad, there was Egyptian salad. The, the 1910s were really the beginning of a long, booming interest in foreign foods, as they were called. I, I mean, it, it, it didn't start in the 1910s either. If you look in cookbooks from the middle of the 19th century, you'll see self-consciously foreign recipes. But by the 1910s is when they're really gaining mass appeal, I would say. So this was, I think, very typical of the era that you'd have a recipe that advertised a foreign provenance, even if it actually you know, wasn't foreign at all when you looked at the ingredients. Well, I also think we have to remember that this is the period of, you know, the United States had become um, essentially an empire in 1898 and had acquired uh, territories in the Philippines and Puerto Rico. And so an interest in this sort of imagined exotic uh, East was, was really central. I see both of those, both cayenne and curry powder, in 19th century cookbooks as well. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't necessarily totally unfamiliar, mm -hmm. um, but it still had this very foreign connotation in a way that, for example, tapioca or cinnamon or chocolate, mm -hmm. which also would have been imported, didn't. So it's, it's, it's very cultural. What, what gets branded as foreign and what doesn't? Well, should we give it a try? Yeah, you want to try, try the I'd love to. It's oh, so good. It's delicious. It's so tender. It's well, really good. It is unbelievable. It's been cooking for four hours. It ought to be tender. It's delicious. You can get tongue in high end restaurants and pay a high end price. As a former chef, I never begrudge anyone charging a decent price for a meal, but you can make tongue at home for $8 a pound.